Chapter 16 Elizabeth's arms and legs were bound to the four corners of the bedposts, and her mouth was gagged. She fought against these restraints with possessed fury, muscles straining, and blood flowing from wrists and ankles. Her flesh was lavered in sweat, and the long, dark hair plastered against the skin. Her eyes were completely black, and she thrashed wildly as Anara continued to speak the words of banishment, standing at the foot of the bed. Callard watched on in horror as the thing inhabiting the body of Elizabeth struggled to maintain its hold. The air was chill in the room, despite the roaring flames of the fireplace, and shadows danced at the edges of his vision. Elizabeth's heavily pregnant body went into spasms, her back arching and lifting her off the bed as Anara's voice rose in intensity. The shadows all around seemed agitated, and Callard could hear a faint whispering in his ears, and his hand closed around the hilt of his sword. Anara had assured him that the demon shades were unable to manifest in this room. She had sanctified and blessed it in the name of the lady, but Callard was still uneasy. With a shout, Anara completed the ritual, and Elizabeth went into a final, shocking paroxysm, eyes rolling in the back of her head, and limbs going rigid. Spasms racked her frame, throwing her around on the bed, which shuddered under the exertions. And then, the girl was suddenly still. Callard moved to Elizabeth's bedside. She was breathing shallowly, for which he was grateful. He had thought for a moment that her heart might actually give in. Anara slumped backwards into a padded chair. She was pale and drawn, with dark rings around her eyes, as if she hadn't slept for a week. The exorcism had clearly drained her. The young Castellan of Garamond was exhausted as well, though his was a physical tiredness. It had been two days since the enemy demon engine had been destroyed, and the Norsecans had been attacking the wall since then non-stop. Callard had managed to snatch a few hours of rest between attacks, but even then his sleep had been haunted by visions of the Green Knight, and he had awoken feeling more tired than ever before. His armor was dented and splattered with gore, and his once pristine blue and red tabard was torn and smeared with mud and blood. Well, he said, is Elizabeth herself? Anara opened her eyes and looked at him with exhausted eyes. The damsel nodded her head. When will she awake? he said. Will she recover? Anara merely shrugged in response. In the distance, Callard heard horns sounding. Another assault was about to commence. He swore and gave Elizabeth one final look. Her breathing became regular, if shallow. Anara curled up her legs beneath her like a little girl and was instantly asleep. More horns blared, and Callard turned and walked wearily out of the room. He closed the door softly behind him. Callard's cousins were waiting for him outside, but they didn't immediately register that he had emerged from Elizabeth's room. You know what must be done, Tassilo, Baldemund was saying, voice low and threatening. I'm not sure anymore that that is the right path, said Tassilo, shaking his head. It is too late for second thoughts now, cousin, said Hubald fiercely. We gave our oath to Folkard. He is relying upon us. Why are you arguing? Folgard is relying on you for what? said Callard, frowning. His cousins froze and then turned slowly to face him. Tassilo dropped his eyes to the floor. Nothing that needs your concern, cousin, said Baldemund. You have enough on your plate already. Callard wanted to press the point, but he found he simply did not have the energy. He was just so tired. Is Elizabeth said Hubald in concern. Is it done? Callard nodded, too weary to speak. Are you all right, cousin? Baldemund asked him in a quiet voice. Just let's go back to the walls, said Callard, ignoring the question. Hectese jolted, feeling a horrible sense of vertigo as her spirit slammed back into her aged, decrepit, and cancer-ridden body. The witch tried to scream in outrage and denial, but a leather gag ensured that nothing but a weak, gargled cry passed her lips. Opening her eyes, she could see little. Once again, she was practically blind, cataracts filling her milky orbs 
and her heart fluttering weakly within the fragile cage that was her ribs. Her hands were tied tightly behind her back. Rats were squealing and rustling through the moldy straw littering the dank ground. In the deepest oubliette beneath Castle Garamond, with her hands bound and her mouth gagged, there was nothing for the witch Hectesse to do but wait for death. Claude was ripped out of his restless haunted sleep by a heavy boot kicking him hard in the side. Horns were sounding from the towers all around, and he groaned. The enemy had been coming at them relentlessly for almost three days now. The defenders had repelled wave after wave of attack. Everything hurt. His body was a mass of bruise upon bruise, and his limbs ached. Breathing in deeply was painful, and he was certain that at least one of his ribs was broken. He twisted his leg badly the day before, and throbbing pain emanated from the knee. The little finger of the right hand had been severed by an enemy axe, and while he knew that he had been lucky, had he not slipped on a pool of blood and fallen on his arse, then the axe would have taken his head off. But that did little to alleviate the pain. Claude had thought that he would have been able to slink away from the front line at some point in the battle, or in the lapses between assaults, but so far there had been no such opportunity. The yeoman wardens were as watchful as eagles, and they guarded all the stairways leading off from the walls. He had already seen them kill half a dozen would be deserters, the screams of the dying men ringing out sharply as they were hurled over the battlements. He considered leaping off, but his legs had begun to shake at a thought. It was maybe thirty feet to the ground, and he was certain that he would break both legs upon landing upon the uneven stones below, if he survived at all. It seemed as though he had only just closed his eyes, but already the next assault was about to begin. Get up, you dogs! barked a grizzled man-at-arms, jabbing the butt of his halberd into the peasants, which were still lying on the ground. One of them did not move, and Claude realized that the man had died in the interim between the last assault, having either frozen to death or succumbed to injury. He didn't look older than fifteen. Get rid of him, snarled the man-at-arms, and Claude was pushed roughly from behind. Together with two other peasants, he manhandled the already ice-cold body over the crenellation, pushing it over the edge to join the growing pile of bodies at the base of the wall. Snow was falling once again, blanketing everything in an ever-deepening layer, and Claude stamped his feet in an attempt to get some feeling back into them. He had cheered as he saw the holy paladin Riolus riding back into the castle, jumping up and down and hollering loudly, hoping that the Grail Knight would acknowledge him as one of his old pilgrims. He had hoped that if Riolus saw him, he might be allowed off the wall in order to go to the Grail Knight, but if he was heard, the knight gave no indication. Claude had tried to convince the yeoman guarding the stairways that his master needed him, but they had laughed in his face. One of them pushed him backwards hard with his polearm, and Claude had fallen on his backside, staring up at the man hatefully. In truth, Claude had felt considerable joy that Riolus was still alive. Though he cared not a jot for the nobility, he found himself pleased that the Grail Knight was not yet among the casualties. There was something special about him, that much was obvious, and Claude felt, somehow, that while that man lived, they still had some hope. It mattered not that he was only one man. While the Grail Knight lived, Claude felt confident that the enemy would be repelled. He pulled off his helmet and scratched his head. A peasant nearby was staring slack-mouthed at a shaved circle on the crown of his head. What are you staring at? said Claude. Are you really his pilgrim? asked the man. He was a simpleton, solid built, with one shoulder hanging half a foot lower than the other. Yeah, he said. You an abbot or something? said the man. That's right, said Claude, puffing out his chest. He looked around to check to see if anyone else was within earshot, and then beckoned the big man towards him. Tell you what, said Claude. You guard my back in the next attack, and if we are both alive at the end of it, I'll make you my novice. Would you? said the man, eye widening. Claude nodded gravely. What's your name? he asked. Otho, Father Abbot. Brother Otho, 
Sounds good, don't it? said Claude. The big man nodded his head. Claude produced a small bone from the tunic pocket with a flourish and held it out to the man, who took it in his hands reverently. What is it? he said breathlessly, staring at it as if it were made of solid gold. The finger of a saint? Better, said Claude in a hushed voice. It's a chicken bone. A chicken bone, said Arthur with reverence in his voice. A chicken bone gnawed on by none other than Riolus, the oh-so-mighty-and-grand, said Claude, affecting a dramatic voice that elicited an exhalation of wonder from the big peasant. It will protect you, but only, only, if you make sure that I, the holy abbot, am kept away from harm. If one heathen lays a hand upon me, the bearer of that sacred bone will be struck down, you understand? The big man nodded his head solemnly. Other horns blared, and warning shouts announced that the enemy longships were drawing near. Trebuchets began firing, and Claude pulled a broken sword from the loop of leather around his waist, feeling quietly smug at having tricked the big man into protecting his back. Perhaps he would survive a little longer than expected. Otto dropped to his knees before Claude, bowing his head. After a moment of staring at the man in incomprehension, Claude chuckled to himself and stepped towards him. What did it matter if he pushed the charade a little further? He made a warning sign in the air, imitating a benediction that he had once seen a priest make, and placed his hand on the man's head. Bless me too, Father Abbot, shouted another peasant, dropping to his knees. Other men pressed in, reaching for Claude with outstretched hands. Others pushed themselves to the ground before him, heads bowed to receive his benediction. These were not just peasant archers and men like he, drafted hastily into service. A number of men-at-arms wearing the duke's white and red tabards were among their number. Claude shook his head at the absurdity of this situation. His pet rat squirmed under his shirt, and he patted it gently, a gormless smile on his face. Here they come again, came a shout. Bless all of you, sons of Riolas, shouted Claude. The peasants gathered around him and roared their approval, and hefted their weapons in their hands as the first arrows began to fire upon the enemy storming the beach. Callard plunged his sword into the neck of another Norskan as he tried to clamber over the battlements. Blood spluttered from the barbarian's lips, yet the dying warrior gripped Callard's blade with one hand, trapping it. As Callard struggled to free the weapon, a man-at-arms to the right fell backwards, a spear jutting out of his chest, and the white-bearded, heavily-muscled Norskan leapt over the wall, howling like a blood-maddened wolf. The veteran enemy swung to the left, slamming the axe into a knight's neck, shearing through metal. As the knight fell, the Norskan ripped the axe free and swung at Callard, who was still struggling frantically to free his trapped sword. Seeing the predicament of Callard, the warrior who had taken hold of the sword grinned, blood dribbling from his mouth. Callard growled in frustration, using all his strength trying to rip the sword loose, but to no avail. Still, he had no intention of releasing the grip on the Garamond heirloom, for he knew that as soon as he let that go, the Norskan would fall backwards to his death, taking the weapon with him. Bertalus slammed into the white-bearded Norskan from the side, driving him into the battlements. Losing his grip on the axe, the old warrior hammered his elbow into Bertalus's helmet, snapping the head backwards. Bertalus reeled, and Callard saw his brother's blade embedded to the hilt in the Norskan's gut. Hubald and Baldemund stepped protectively in front of Bertalus as the Norskan pulled the bloody sword from his flesh and hurled it away from him. Blood was gushing from the mortal wound, but the Norskan merely roared in fury and hurled himself at Callard's cousins. Callard placed one foot upon the edge of the crenellations and heaved with all his might, and finally tore the sword free, severing the Norskan's fingers in the process. The man dropped backwards, still grinning, and then was gone. The young lord of Garamond swung around to see Whitebeard with his paw-like hands wrapped around Hubald's neck, throttling the life out of him even as Baldemund stabbed him repeatedly. Callard bellowed wordlessly as he lashed himself to the aid of his cousins, 
and the Norsegun looked up at him, still howling, just a fraction of a second before the blade of Garamond carved into his skull. Blood and brain matter splattered over Callard's face and chest, and the Norsegun finally fell. Breach! shouted Tassilo, leaping past Callard as giant, black-armored warriors heaved themselves onto the battlements behind them. A knight fell, hacked from collarbone to sternum by a sickeningly powerful axe blow, and his companion butchered a pair of men-at-arms, black-bladed twin swords flashing. Tassilo barged into the first of them with his shield. The Norsegun was a head taller than the young Bretonian, but the icy stonework was slippery underfoot, and he lost his balance. The Norsegun barked a curse and dropped his axe, black-armored fingers scrabbling for a handhold as he fell back over the battlements. The second Chaos Warrior took a step towards the wall defenders, pale eyes burning with cold intensity within the shadowy depths of the helmet. Almost as an afterthought, he lashed out with one of his swords, and Tassilo fell with a gasp of pain as the tainted weapon carved through the plate armor encasing the forearm. Tassilo dropped to his knees, grasping his wounded arm, and Kellard saw his cousin's vambrace blacken and corrode. The Chaos Warrior's broad shoulders were hung with wolf pelts, and he towered over Kellard and his companions. Black smoke rose from the deadly, jagged blades of his weapons, and Kellard knew that this must have been one of the enemy chieftains. More enemy warriors leapt over the walls behind him, but Kellard's gaze was fixed on the giant warrior closing towards him. This was a worthy foe, he knew, and he relished the opportunity to prove himself before the lady and his comrades, and to himself. This one's mine, he said, though Baldemon and Hubald were already stepping away, leaving him at a four, alone and exposed, although Callard didn't notice. Tassilo managed to scramble back before the chieftain's advance, still clutching at the wounded arm in agony. Callard gripped the hilt of the Sword of Garamond tightly and whispered a quick prayer to the Lady of the Lake as he stepped forwards to meet the enemy champion. A shadow fell over him and he ducked involuntarily as a winged shape swooped low over his head. The enemy champion took a step back, raising his swords up before him, but before he could ward off the blow, a lance was driven into his chest, punching through his armor and impaling him on its length. The lance tip burst out through the back of the body, transfixing him, and then the Pegasus Mountain Knight was passed, banking sharply off to the right. A cheer rose up from the defenders as Lodafair flew over their heads, drawing his sword and brandishing it in salute. Callard realized that scores of men had seen the Paravonian strike down the enemy chieftain, and he had no doubt that all those who hadn't would know about it before the end of the day. That bastard! said Callard. Once again, Lodafair had claimed the glory, and Callard and his ilk were left to clean up the remnants. The Norskans came at him in a rush, and Callard only managed to get his shield up in time to turn aside a swinging axe. He was knocked to the knees by the force behind the blow, and he slashed desperately with his sword. The blade sank deep into the attacker's scalp. The Norskan fell with a curse, and was finished off by a peasant, who hammered the spike tip of his polearm into the man's face. As Callard rose back to his feet, the shield was knocked aside by a heavy hammer, the blow designed to leave him unprotected. A boot struck him full in the chest, sending him crashing backwards, breastplate groaning under the force, and the wind driven out of his lungs. He hit the ground hard, flat on his back, and his head struck the stone. Had he not been wearing the helmet, he might have been killed even. As it was, he was merely stunned, although he would have a headache for a few days if he survived the latest assault. Winded, he struggled to rise, although he saw that the Norse who had managed to storm the ramparts had been killed, and their ladders were pushed from the walls. The Norse champion, impaled upon the length of Lodafer's lance, was still alive, although he was clearly mortally wounded. The blood that dripped from the wound was black, and hissed as it struck the stonework melting shallow pits in the rock where it fell. He stared up hatefully at Callard as he stepped forwards to finish the warrior. Callard's blow shattered the Norskan's helmet and took off half his head away, but still he didn't die. The shattered pieces of the warrior's helmet fell away from his face, exposing a mass of skinless flesh. Maggots writhed through the fibrous muscles of the champion's face, and his lipless mouth was studded with rotting fangs. A single great horn protruded from the Norskan's forehead, 
Hjallard had fought at a horn was part of the brutal ornamentation of the Norsegan helmet, but he saw now that it was part of the champion's own flesh and bone. The chieftain spat a gobbet of phlegm up at Callard, which splattered against his helmet, just below the islet. He could hear the foul acidic sputum eating into the metal, and he ripped the helmet off his head, dropping it at his feet. The enemy chieftain chuckled, ice white eyes filled with dark humor, and Callard struck him again, this time hacking his putrid head from his shoulders. A rancid stink rose out of the corpse, and Callard gagged. Several men-at-arms were with Tassilo, helping remove the armor from his arm, and Callard saw that the wound was already festering with poison. Callard barked an order, demanding that the champions fell, black-bladed swords, be wrapped in blankets and hurled off the walls. He ordered the rancid corpse of the Norsecon thrown over the battlements too, and half a dozen men lost the contents of their stomachs at the repulsive stink of the quickly decomposing body. Bowmen stepped lightly through the knights and the men-at-arms at a shout from a yeoman warden, and they began firing between the crenellations once again as another enemy assault was about to hit home. Bone-tired, Callard leant against the wall, back to the battlements and closed his eyes, breathing hard. It seemed like only moments had passed before he heard ladders slam up against the walls as the next enemy assault struck. Weary beyond words, he opened his eyes and pushed away from the battlements, turning to wait for the enemy to appear. As weary as he was, Claude was starting to enjoy the level of respect and deference he was receiving from the soldiers around him. In truth, he had begun to believe his own rhetoric. He had started to believe that he was the prophet of Riolus' glory, and that in his exalted position he was afforded a certain amount of holy protection. And so it came at a considerable shock when a hulking Norsecan berserker, his red hair and beard a tangle of braids and dreadlocks, tore through the fanatical devotees like a maelstrom of death and grabbed him by the shirt front. Claude's eyes bulged and he scrambled to free himself from the man's grip. A mailed fist smashed into his face, then he was lifted off his feet and tossed over the battlements. He was unconscious before hitting the ground. Elizabeth awoke to sharp pain, gasping. It took her a moment to realize that she could see clearly now, and that she was no longer curled up upon the rotting pallet in the dank dungeon. She was lying in a soft bed, and she stared up at the rich velvet draped above the four-poster bed, not knowing if she was dreaming, or if this was reality, and being trapped in the body of the old crone had been the delusion. The sheets under which she lay were drenched in sweat, and she doubled over in agony, groaning, as shooting pain again lanced through her. Her hands clutched at her belly, and horror rose within her as she felt the swelling there. She threw over the covers and stared in incomprehension at a heavily pregnant young body. Had she escaped one horrific nightmare, only to find herself in another? Your contractions are close, said a voice from nearby, and she turned her head to see a slight, waifish young woman with a distant expression on her face. She recognized her as Callard's sister, Anara, and she gaped at her in horror as she digested the damsel's words. Con... contractions? she breathed. The child is ready to enter the world, confirmed Anara. Tell me this is a nightmare, said Elizabeth in desperation. Tell me this is not real. Anara held a wet cloth to Elizabeth's forehead as fresh pain made her double in agony. She called for water and towels over the shoulder, and as she shook her head in the negative, Elizabeth cried, wailing in fear, incomprehension, and pain. How? she managed. Then another thought struck her, and she leant towards Anara, clutching at her in desperation. Who is the father? The enemy, said Anara.